invitation after the service, after we have the message and after communion, we will be giving out some uh, gifts to the ladies of the church. So don't get out of here without taking a handful of something home because we've got some special treats for you. So I just thought I'd break the ice this morning by uh, having a show of hands here. I know some of you don't like tests, but this test, I think you can handle it. I just wonder how many of you have, how many of you had or have a mother? Is a show of hands here. <laughs> For those of you who didn't raise your hand, you want to stand up and explain what's going on here? There's a few of you didn't, but Anyway, well, happy Mother's Day to all of your mothers, and happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers, too. We have a lot in common. We all have a mother, right? Today, we're going to be looking at uh, the story of Obed's mother and uh, how it was that she came to be a mom. But uh, first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your... uh, for the opportunity to come before you this morning to look into your word. We thank you for uh, the blessings of motherhood, how we have all been blessed by mothers. We thank you for the blessings in being uh, part of the bride of Christ, the blessing of being called out of darkness into your marvelous light. I would ask, Lord, that you show us your ways this morning. Show us your ways through history. Show us your story of redemption. Show us your face in the glory of Jesus. Gather us in under your word and under your wing and under your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Excuse me. It never fails to amaze me how the music uh, not only is, is always well chosen, for the Sunday morning service, but how it applies, how sometimes the music, I would rather just keep singing for another hour and let that minister to us. But I thank Paul for choosing uh, righteous music this morning, but also uh, it just tears up my heartstrings because these authors of these musical pieces have written truths that, uh, that do live down through the ages, and some of them are new tunes, and they're still... Uh, classics in their own right, just from their uh, strength of truth. Well, I'd like to introduce this morning, introduce today's topic by looking at the first couple of verses in the book of Hebrews. If you'd turn, uh, if you want, we're only going to look at them briefly, but this is a, a part of an introduction. It's how I get to the book of Ruth is by, through the first couple of verses of Hebrews, this will be the launching point for a two-part message, but don't worry, I'm not going to be here next week, too. The, both parts are going to be this morning. Uh, the first part is going to revolve around the redemption of Obed's mom, she who was called Ruth. And the second part is going to revolve around your redemption as expressed in the New Testament as we celebrate the Lord's Supper here this morning. And we will commemorate that in communion. But the book of Hebrews starts out in a very bold way. It has a, it has a uh, huge historical uh, connotation to it. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. This first verse reminds us that there were many methods used by God in the Old Testament, both in the people, in the writings, in the messages that the uh, uh, prophets had for us, in the persons, the, the uh, characters of the individuals, that there were, are many ways in, that the Old Testament uh, gives us glimpses of how God works out his purposes and plans. But the Old Testament revelation was incomplete. It was progressive. It started out piece by piece as we got little views, little snippets of what God's purposes were. And these came through in a multitude of stories, building one piece upon another, not always in sequential order. For instance, at the same time that the book of Jonah was being written, that foretold and uh, uh, 
uh, foretold about Christ's three days and nights in, in the belly of the earth. At the same time, there was Micah out predicting that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Well, are, we, is this, uh, are these prophecies about his birth, or are they about his death, or are they about his resurrection, or what? Well, they were about all these things. They didn't always come in chronological order. There was not a sequence. And so it is no, I have great empathy towards the Jews for not understanding the Old Testament and going, oh, well, this obviously points to Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, he's the fulfillment of all these prophecies. It's a difficult procedure. If we didn't have the New Testament that, uh, that uh, explains some of these things for us, we may be like the Jews, not having that light, uh, that light uh, that the Holy Spirit wants us to see. But we... We have, uh, for instance, Jonah the prophet spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Well, Jesus said, this is prefiguring the three days and the three nights that I will be in the belly of the earth. And it's, uh, he says, that's the only sign when the, when the Pharisees asked him for a sign. He said, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. And of all the things in the book of Jonah that Jesus could have said, well, you know, what, what is really a sign in Jonah that is pointing towards the Messiah, specifically the time spent in the belly of the fish. Those three days and three nights were the sign that pointed to the Messiah, that after he died on the cross, he would spend three days and three nights. It's not like the rest of Jonah has no significance. It's not like we throw out the rest of the book and say, well, that's, an, that's a weird story. It's a great story. It stands on its own. There's a lot of object lessons to be had in it about obedience or the problems with disobedience, like being cast overboard by your buddies. There's a lot of object lessons in there, not trusting that God's uh, really ought to go to the Gentiles with this message of salvation. All kinds of lessons from Jonah. But what Jesus pointed out was that the probably the primary point of the book of Jonah is pointing to the three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. So who would have thought that this time in the fish's belly would have anything to do with anything in future days? And if you were a Jew in that day and reading the book of Jonah, you would say, well, that's an interesting story, and Jonah should have minded his P's and Q's, and you would have come to a lot of conclusions. You probably wouldn't have concluded that, ah, this is pointing to the Lord's time in the earth. And so this, as implied by the writer to the Hebrews, is one of the many portions and many ways that God spoke to his people in the past. Another obvious way would be the dramatic portrayal of Abraham and Isaac going up to Mount Moriah to offer sacrifice. That was a pretty dramatic point in those guys' life. I mean, for Abraham, he's going, well, I I hope the Lord provides because as his son Isaac said, Lord, we have the firebox, we have the wood that's strapped on my back, but where's the sacrifice? Good question. (laughs) God will provide. But as far as Abraham knew, the sacrifice was to be Isaac, his son, That was his instruction. Go up to Mount Moriah, offer up your son Isaac, your son, your only son whom you loved. And this, of course, was a powerful picture of how God would, in the future, in the new covenant, would allow his son, his only son whom he uh, loved, to be sacrificed as an offering for our sin. So these are some Old Testament ways. We could cite many other portions and many other ways that the writer to Hebrews says that God portrayed Uh, his ways in the Old Testament, little snippets of things. We could look at Daniel and his night night visions about future days. We could cite many of the Psalms, especially that uh, cluster of Psalms 22, 23, 24 that talk about uh, Jesus' death, basically a suffering servant in Psalm 22, about his role as a shepherd, the great shepherd in Psalm 23, his role as a king in Psalm 24. All these pointed forward. It's like a neon sign going, and what are they pointing to? They keep pointing to this thing. Vacancy, vacancy, vacancy. Neon sign. Always pointing ahead to Jesus, but never the full picture in any story in the back. The whole 
Mosaic law pointed to Christ, the Levitical law, the way things were done, all the intricacies, all the details pointed to Jesus, his work, his person, his ways, his words, the fact that he is God, all of this pointed to him. We could talk about um, Isaiah's chapter 53 about the suffering servant is a vivid picture of Jesus' uh, brutal death. All these puzzle pieces would, of course, not quite equal God's fullest resur- uh, revelation of himself to us in these last days in the person of his son. And so the writer says, in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. So Jesus is the ultimate revelation that all the Old Testament pointed toward. That's, I hope that's not new to you. I hope you know that. But this is just a reminder. So today we're going to actually look at one of those pieces. It's not the full picture of Christ. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily a type, but is, it is a prefiguring of the redemption that we have received through the shed blood of Jesus Christ for our sins. And it's seen in a very simple, down-to-earth very earthy. You can almost smell the dust in this story. You can, you can smell the grain. You can smell the gluten, huh, Becky? You can smell the grain in this being harvested in this story of Ruth. And so that's where we're going to go back now is to the story of Ruth that's in the Old Testament. The one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth book. It's interesting that when you get to, to the book of Ruth, there has been one book of the Bible has a man's name. Joshua, and one book has a woman's name, Ruth. After that, it's uh, pretty heavy towards the, towards the men. Only Ruth and Esther are uh, Bible books with ladies' names. I need to take a break here just a second. Talk among yourselves. You may not know it, but this is a pretty heavy burden to bear. I empathize with Bear getting up here week after week with the burden on his shoulders of presenting the Word of God, presenting it truthfully, presenting it accurately, and keeping it interesting. It is, it is a tough chore. That's why I get dry mouth. The book of Ruth as a uh, uh, viewing Ruth's redemption as a picture of your redemption. So the, the book of Ruth, again, uh, much like Jonah, much like any of the Old Testament books, stands on its own as, uh, as what has been called the loveliest short story ever written. Boy, how would you like to have that, that uh, kind of uh, uh, compliment to something you had written? The loveliest short story ever written. I think it's it's true, it, and it's not our purpose today to harvest all the riches that are contained therein, but we will do well to glean at least the concept of redemption. And we're going to do a little brief background check on this because the thrust of the story is in, uh, or of our concern today is in chapter 4, but I want you to remember that the, the historical context of Ruth, and it's during the time of Judges that was a low point in the, in the time of Israel, a low point in their history. And it's proven by the last verse in the book of Judges that says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That kind of reminds me of the day I've been living in, right? There's plenty of that going on, people doing what is right in their own eyes. But it is logical then that when the book of Ruth opens up, it says in those days there was famine in the land. I don't know if that was a judgment of God upon people, everybody doing what was right in his own eyes, or if it was just God wanting to say, I'm going to set the stage for this awesome story of Ruth. I'm not sure. But there was famine in the land. There was spiritual famine, obviously, And there was a literal physical famine as well. And so this man from Bethlehem named Elimelech took his wife, Naomi, and said, Honey, we got to get some food. And so they went 
across yonder river, across the Dead Sea to the land of Moab where there was apparently plenty of food. And it looked like a hopeful place to go. They were there about 10 years. But during that time, Elimelech, the husband, died. And their two sons married local gals, these Moabites is. And then likewise, the two sons died. So the hopes that Elimelech and Naomi and the boys had as they entered Moab, all these hopes were suddenly derailed and were taken from a point of of regional famine throughout the land of Judah, regional famine down to a uh, a, a really uh, personal tragedy. And so the story goes from sour to bitter. And if, if the story ended here after the first five verses, it would carry the distinction of being the worst short story ever written. Right? I mean, this has gone from bad to worse in a hurry. It's just like falling off a cliff. Honey, there's hope in Moab. There's food there. Let's go there. Away they go. Elimelech dies. The two sons die after they have married these local gals. So that's uh, what has been established in the first five verses in then is that the writer has generated three helpless and hopeless widows. A widow in that day is, was not a good position to be in. You had no provider. And for Naomi, not only that, but she's a stranger in a strange land. She's from Judah, but she's over in Moab. And so she decides to go home. And, she, and you know, he t- she tells her daughters-in-law, I'm going back to Bethlehem where the Famine has relented, praise the Lord. And she suggests that her two daughters-in-law would have a better time of it staying in Moab with their own families where they can be taken care of, where they have a future rather than following her back to Judah, back to Bethlehem where, they're, where they will become strangers in a strange land, where there is an unknown future in an unknown land with an unknown people. It's just common sense, as the TV ad says. But, fortunately, this isn't TV. Something grander than common sense was at work. Because during those 10 years in Moab, one of the daughters-in-law, the one named Ruth, the widow of Naomi's son, Malan, Ruth had converted to, Ju- <coughs> excuse me, had converted to Judaism. She had, as Bear was teaching us last week from 1 Thessalonians, she had turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. So she had um, probably at first been just a, uh, what is called a God-fearer in the New Testament. That is, Gentiles who like to hang out at synagogue, like to hear about the Jewish God and uh, maybe take an interest in him. Some of them say, hey, I want to become a Jew. This is a God I can serve. This is a guy I can sink my teeth into. This is a God of promise. This is my kind of God, as opposed to the some little uh, graven image of, that, that people bowed down to and brought their fruit cakes to and stuff. This is the true God. I want to serve him. And so Ruth had converted there. Uh, and much like Abraham of Ur, a forebear of, of all these Jews, she went out not knowing where she was going, just as Paul read in Hebrews 11 this morning. She went out really not knowing where she was going. She knew this God. She had been, it had been presented to her through the teaching of the law, the Torah, that here was a God who a person can trust in. And she was seeking to live in a land of promise with the people of promise and worship the God of promise. And so in uh, verse 16 of the first chapter, uh, after Naomi had suggested that Ruth and her Uh, the the other daughter-in-law, Orpah, uh, stay in Moab. Ruth said in verse 16, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. And where you die, 
I will die, and there I will be uh, buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Well, here's a woman of faith. I, th- I don't know, but I think that Naomi was probably shocked by this. It certainly silenced the converse- conversation. Naomi can't argue with Ruth, and so the two widows head back to Bethlehem of Judea. And since they arrive at the beginning of the barley harvest, and the barley harvest is followed immediately by the wheat harvest, it's a good time for uh, Ruth to go out and do some gleaning, that is, uh, gathering food from the corners and the edges of the field. You don't hear much about gleaning these days, but God had incorporated it into the Mosaic law as a way of providing for the poor and the widow and the stranger and the sojourner and Ruth qualified in spades because she was now a poor widow from a far land with no means of support. And so way back, buried deep in the law is this provision where God is so loving people who are not able to care for themselves that he provides for them. You don't hear too much about gleaning. But the corners of the field, according to the law, were to be left unharvested. Indeed, the heart of the field was not to be stripped bare, but some of the stalks of grain were to be left. Some of the fruit is to be left on the orchard trees. Some of the fruit is to be left on the vines in the vineyard so that those who have no way of supporting themselves, no way of feeding themselves, the widow, the orphan, the sojourner, the stranger, can have a bite to eat. What kind of God is this who provides in such a great way even for those who are outcast? And I hope we don't forget that as we think of ourselves, as we start picturing ourselves in this story too. As a kid, my dad and I used to go out to my Uncle Frank's house. My dad's brother, Frank, was a successful potato farmer in uh, north of Rupert. And it so happened that in those days, in those days it sounds like back in the 4th century, in those days back in the 20th century when I was growing up, the big harvesting equipment was too big to get up to the, the ditches because there was no sprinkler irrigation. There was a ditch and there were siphon tubes. And so at the top of the row, the harvester couldn't get to the very end. They had to start turning it around. So there were several hills of potatoes at the top of each row that was just there for the taking. And so my Uncle Frank would call us out and he'd say, bring your gunny sacks and your basket and your shovels, and we'd go out and load up for the winter on the best spuds you ever ate. I love spuds. But that was gleaning, that, and that's similar to the way the biblical uh, mandate was to leave the ends of the fields unharvested. Leave a little bit of stuff out, the good stuff, out in the middle for those gleaners. So gleaners like us took advantage of that. It wasn't that we couldn't afford potatoes. It's just that they would go to waste if we didn't show up. So we went every fall in October. It was great. And that's what Ruth is up to in this story God built his own welfare system within the law to cover those who could, uh, without the means to provide for themselves. And this gleaning was an integral part of the system. You can, like I said earlier, you can almost smell the dirt in this, uh, in this story. You can smell the dust as the harvesting of the barley and the grain goes on. This book is about very ordinary people. They live close to the earth, but they also live close to the God who created the earth. They are the salt of the earth. And so when the story opens and we have this sour taste left over from the book of Judges and then it turns to bitterness and as expressed by Naomi when she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because that means bitter, I'm bitter. We go from the sourness and the bitterness And now to the salt of the earth, people who are living close to the earth, who are living close to their God in close communion to him and are being rewarded therefore. And so there's another key player, of course, comes into the story of Ruth. And his name is Boaz. He happens to be a close relative of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. And 
as the sovereignty of God would have it. This is not coincidence. This is no accident. As the sovereignty of God would have it, Ruth is gleaning in Boaz's field. Now, probably in those days, from everything I read, it wasn't but, like uh, you had your a path or something, and the next guy had his field. It was probably one large community field. These people lived in Bethlehem, Boaz and Elimelech when he was alive. Folks like that lived in town, and there was a large community-type field and probably markers within the field that said, okay, from this marker to this marker is Boaz's, and from this marker to this marker is somebody else's. And so Boaz, Boaz's section of the community field happened to be where Ruth was doing her gleaning. And that's, again, no accident, and it's uh, integral to the story. So Boaz comes along and uh, says to his servant, he says, well, that's, that's not in your version, but that's in the original, I'm sure. I, I just read it between the lines. Because he sees this lovely gal from, well, he doesn't know where from, but she's new. It's a new face to him. And Boaz says, so who's the new gal here out here gleaning? And uh, his servant uh, lets him know. He says, well, this is, uh, this is uh, Ruth the Moabitess, and she's a widowed daughter-in-law of, of the widow Naomi. And, uh, yeah, she has a funny accent, but she's doing some gleaning out here to feed herself and her mother-in-law. Well, Boaz takes a liking to Ruth. Actually, he takes a loving to Ruth. Let's get to the end of the story. He takes a loving to Ruth, okay? It's not just a liking. He likes her work ethic. He likes the fact that she has converted to Judaism from being an idol worshiper. I think he likes her accent, too. Oh, those are Moabites. they got such a great accent. But he likes her concern for her mother-in-law. There's a lot to be liked about Ruth's character besides the fact that she's probably a handsome gal from across the way. So Boaz himself takes her under his wing and provides some extra grain for uh, her and Naomi. He is providing protection from possible hostile fellow harvesters who might abuse this new person in town who talks a funny dialect and uh, you know has no connections here. Boaz says, I'm going to watch it. You watch it. You hang out with my gleaners here and my pickers. They're going to give you a little extra anyway. And, he's, uh, and so he's providing protection for her. And at the end of the day, literally, at the end of the day, in uh, chapter 2, well, I jumped ahead of myself here, uh, as Boaz meets Ruth in verse 12 of chapter 2, he says, May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Like I said, Boaz likes the fact that she has become uh, a Jewess from having been just a Gentile. And at the end of the day, when Ruth returns with a very full uh, basket of, of grain to Naomi in verse 22, no, excuse me, verse 20. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, uh, after she asked her about who, whose field were you harvesting in, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed, that is Boaz, may he be blessed of the Lord who, ha who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, this man is our relative or our near kinsman. He is one of our redeemers or our closest relatives. In the margin, my version says he is one of our redeemers. And so this idea of redemption comes in mind, and that is someone who protects those who have no protection for themselves, protects from danger and uh, destruction. So the story continues such that this kinsman redeemer named Boaz becomes God's provision whereby Ruth can be redeemed or saved from difficulty and danger by a near kinsman of Elimelech. And this redemption, uh, this redemption is right from the law. In fact, if you want to turn back to Leviticus 25, 
we've got just a little bit of time to look at this. Leviticus 25, we see how this law of redemption was set up by God long before in the Levitical law so that people like Ruth would be taken care of. Leviticus 25, and uh, we'll start in verse 23. This is uh, listed under the law of redemption. Leviticus 25, 23, The land, moreover, it says, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. Thus, for every piece of your property, you are to, prov- you are to provide for the redemption of the lands. Now, you were saying, or you're saying to yourself, now, wait a minute, what does this have to do with land, or what does this have to do with Ruth? As it turns out, this story This story of redemption is going to revolve around a little piece of property that apparently Naomi had uh, inherited uh, by being the widow of Elimelech. It's a little bit foggy, but there is a land issue. And then in verse 25, it carries on, If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor, like Naomi and Ruth, if this fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor, he has to sell part of his property then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. Or in, the, uh, in case a man has no kinsman, but so recovers his means as to find sufficient for its redemption, then he shall calculate the years, and it goes on and on, has a lot of details here that, that don't apply. But this keeps the land within the family, okay? So um, the widow has received a bit of an inheritance, as it were, a piece of land from her, uh, ex, or from her deceased husband. And in this instance, Naomi is going to try to fetch some money for that land, and Boaz is going to say, one of us kinsmen, one of us kinsmen needs to redeem that or uh, uh, buy it or acquire it. It's not really a purchase. It's more of an acquiring And so the only thing standing in the way of Boaz from acquiring this piece of land and the gal that's attached to it because Ruth becomes a part of this transaction, the only way for him, the only thing that's standing in his way is that there is a closer kinsman than he. That is someone who is a more, uh, a relative closer related to Naomi than he. And so we pick up the story in chapter 4. Here's the setting. This, uh, we're just going to read a few of these verses so that you kind of get the feeling here. Chapter 4 of Ruth, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate. And By the way, I just have to mention this because I'm going to forget it otherwise. This is considered to be one of the earliest and one of the fewest remaining accounts of how these sorts of transactions ever happened back in those days. You know, uh, selling a piece of property or transferring a piece of property was not that big of a deal. I mean, it's not like they're going to, you know, chisel it in stone and post it on some monument there in Athens so that it'll be there for in perpetuity. This was just an agreement with witnesses. It was a legal transaction. But this picture is one of the, one of the few remaining pictures we have of how these sorts of transactions happen in that day. So now, back to verse 1. So Boaz went up to the gate, that is the gate of Bethlehem, and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. He's getting a, whatever, a quorum of elders, a a quorum of witnesses. He's just basically creating a court situation at the gate of the city, which is the way business was transacted in those days. You're going to find we've, you've got a kind of a jury of witnesses here. You've got a, a business transaction going to happen. You're going to have evidence brought in, facts acknowledged. And, so, uh, and then there's going to be the, the little uh, uh, custom to kind of uh, make the transfer legal. Verse 3, then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belongs to our brother 
Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, that is the closer relative, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. If not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and, after, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So plan A was for the nearest, nearest kinfolk to redeem the piece of ground. Plan B was for Boaz. Uh, so if the nearest kinsman didn't want to redeem it, Boaz had that option. But the, the nearer kinsman had the first right of refusal. So Boaz is offering it to him. What he doesn't mention is that, oh, yeah, by the way, there is a gal attached to this transfer of land. There is uh, basically a levirate marriage that's involved here. Uh, but he doesn't tell him that. So the guy says, and he said, I will redeem it. So the kinsman who is nearer to Naomi than Boaz says, eh, done deal, let's shake on it. Verse 5, then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, uh, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Oh, oh this changes things. The story has just changed. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any manner. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. In other words, the guy who is passing up, his, has the first right of refusal, says, I'm passing. So I'm basically passing the buck to you, dude. I'm passing the sandal to you. Uh, I'm glad I polished those yesterday. So he passes the shoe. And... Of course, this must have been written for a, a while after the actual transaction. I mean, this must have been maybe years, maybe decades, maybe a century or two after this activity that happened in Ruth actually happened. Because otherwise, why would the author explain in verse 7, this was the custom in former times that the shoe was passed as a saying, I'm transferring my right to you. So it, this may have been written quite a while after the fact. Verse 8, so the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. And then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that to I have brought or that and all that belong to Chilion and Malon, that is Elimelech's two sons. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. All the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, and may you achieve wealth in Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, which Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. And then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name became, uh, become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. So here's the setting. You've got the court, the basically the local court, the elders, the witnesses, the evidence, the piece of property, the passing of the shoe, the passing of the, or the transferring the right of redemption. The closest relative passes on that. It's up to Boaz. He redeems her. And so it's please pass the shoe time. Seems like kind of a silly thing to us, but it worked. Uh, some of that 
outcome of this is that uh, the little piece of land that Naomi owned as Elimelech's wife is preserved within the family. Uh, also preserved is Ruth, who is transferred legally from a poor destitute widow to now become the wife of a wealthy landowner. I mean, there, what's not to like about that? And she is kept in the family of the kinsmen of Elimelech. Also preserved is Naomi, who by now is, uh, is the mother-in-law of a wealthy landowner's wife. Still in need of being taken care of, but if Boaz doesn't see to it, I'm sure Ruth will. So it's a win-win situation for all these parties involved. So what started out as a sour, bitter story turned into a real salt-of-the-earth story and has now become a very sweet story. If you had a great chef of Chinese food, he'd say you've got all the elements of a great dish there. You've got sour and bitter and sweet and salty. This is a good dish, and this is, this is, a, this is a great story. And our author tells us that Ruth conceived a child through Boaz, that the child's name was Obed. There was a name the young buffaloes could have chosen. Who had a, and Obed had a son named Jesse, and Jesse had a son named David, and David had a son named Solomon, etc. And when Matthew went to writing the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1, he just basically clipped and pasted these last verses in this book and put them right in his genealogy because they were, it was so straightforward. It's like, this is so great how this, this Gentile woman comes into the bloodline of the Savior. There's a lot more could be said about that. Well, I said at the outset that, that uh, Ruth's, Redemption is a picture of your redemption. And while the story of Ruth stands alone on its own two feet, and it is very lovely, we who hold the New Testament see it as being a sign pointing to how we also were redeemed. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask uh, Kenny to go up and wake up Dave upstairs because he wanted to come down for communion. And I'd like the, uh, the men and the... Uh, music team to come forward. We're going to uh, have communion at this time, but the sermon isn't over because we're going to apply Ruth's redemption to see how our own redemption, how it comes to play. So I have one more page out of the seven left. Ruth, in a way, almost serves as a parable for us. A very earthy story, an earthly story about a spiritual reality that was one for us on the cross. And so today we're not going to pass the shoe. We're not going to pass the hat. We're going to pass the plate. We're going to pass the cup. This is a great time for us. Uh, we practice open communion here at Magic Valley Bible Church. If you're a saved Christian, please participate. Feel free. If you're not, then let these symbolic elements pass by. But we started out in Hebrews. I told these guys there's a little bit of a sermon left when they get up here, so they're just going to have to put up with this. They can see it's a very busy page, too, with lots of drinking <laughs> involved. We started out with the book of Hebrews, and it said, In these last days God has spoken to us in his Son. We can take the picture of Ruth and say, Well, that's one of the many pieces of the puzzle, the Old Testament puzzle, that pointed to the, the means of our own redemption. As prefigured in Ruth. So we're going to start with a short period of confession, just a time of silence where we can confess our sins, and then we're going to go to Matthew uh, 26 and see the Lord's Supper instituted. Let's uh, take a that moment. That he sits to, at your right hand, that he intercedes for us, and we thank you for that. These are blessings we could not purchase on our own. So, Father, we just ask you to forgive us our sins, and thank you for this time. Uh, bless this. Uh, symbolic bread, bless this symbolic uh, juice that uh, as they portray the body and blood of Christ shed long ago that we can uh, commemorate your redemption of us through, through this uh, sharing communion. And we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of redemption in the New Testament sees Jesus as our Boaz, 
who has legally acquired us through the cross. It was a legal transaction, much like passing the shoe. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, and according to the law, that is the Mosaic law, one may, <clears throat> excuse me, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. So Jesus Christ fulfills the law to acquire us, much as uh, Boaz fulfilled the law to acquire Ruth. The New Testament calls this transaction justification. Justification, which simply means that God the judge declares us to be not guilty of sins based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. He declares us to be not guilty. It's a legal transaction processed through the, <clears throat> excuse me, through the highest court available. So let's, uh, let's look at Matthew 26, 26. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So we're not going to pass the shoe as a remembrance of the transaction. We are going to break the bread as a remembrance to this transaction of our redemption. Let's eat this. Jesus bread. legally acquire us through the cross, but... He is also our Boaz in another regard, and we are his Ruth. Boaz really loved Ruth, and Jesus really loves the redeemed. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. In John we read, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. So uh, as Jesus instituted the Last Supper, besides passing the bread, it says in verse 27, And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's at the... Uh, at the great banquet between the bride and his groom, or between the, excuse me, the groom and his bride, excuse me. So the marriage supper of the Lamb will be when we, when we drink this with Christ. In the meantime, we have this memorial service, this remembrance, this commemorative service. So let's drink together. You can uh, pass your cups to the middle and the, the men will pick them up. But I have one more, one more thing I want to read to you. What's the outcome of this redemption? For Ruth, it was new life. We even read there that the ladies of Bethlehem told Naomi that you have received new life through being redeemed by Boaz. And indeed, there was this new young baby. But we have also received new life. It says in Romans 6, 4, Therefore, we, that is the redeemed, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So this is a great commemoration of that newness of life that we have associating ourselves with being redeemed by, being purchased by, being owned by Jesus Christ who redeemed us from the shed blood on the cross. So that's the story of Ruth and her redemption. And that's a little bit of the story of you and me and our redemption. It's bigger than this, but that's a little snippet of the Old Testament, again, pointing to the new. Let's close in prayer. Father, beloved Father, who cares for us and has... Uh, provided for us in amazing ways, just as you provided for Ruth and Naomi. We who came to you broken and needy and still come to you broken and needy, we thank you for the earthly story of Obed's mom, Ruth, and her redeemer, Boaz. We thank you for the story in the New Testament of our redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he is our he is the groom and we are his bride. 
May we be humbled as we view this ancient portrait that points to your redemption of us. Give us comfort in this, Lord. Give us encouragement. And thank you for giving us Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray.